Well, okay, so, so the reason I was asked, uh, the, art, the heritage officer was, I did two projects just before the COVID that were kind of very strongly influenced by the heritage of the local area that I live in, which is Kaluk and Rathwire. Yeah. Okay, so the first one was, uh, I called it a sense of place, and it was for a commission for the new school in Rathwire. And um, the, the reason that uh, it's called a percent for art commission, uh, when they start building new roads, you know, motorways and stuff like that, they left aside a little uh, percentage for uh, permanent artworks. Yeah. And then when the roads were all built, they start giving them to new schools and stuff like that. It's a state run scheme yeah. and it's a competition and you apply for it. So I won the one for Rathwire National School, right, right. Uh, which was very nice because I was a former pupil of the school. Yeah. Uh, so I was very honoured and I knew a lot about the area. But I had a conversation with somebody one night who said to me that I had grown up in Rathwire and that she said there was never a village there, all right? But she wasn't from Ireland, she was from England. And she'd come to live in the Rathwire area and she said it's only a collection of a few houses. But when I was growing up, there was, you know, it's a very old village, yeah. okay? Because there's a rat at the top of the hill, yeah. all right? Um, so that's what kind of inspired me when I applied for the commission was that a lot of new people have moved into the area who wouldn't necessarily know the kind of what went on in the area, how old the village was and all that kind of thing and the history yeah. and the folklore and the heritage. Yeah. So I decided that that was the topics that I would discuss in the artworks for the school, all right? And I also involved the children. I worked with the children for a month because again, a lot of the kids' parents are not from the area. So we worked on the same themes together, all right? And at the end, I uh, framed some of their work and put, because it was new school, the walls are all bare, I, I framed a lot of the children's artwork and put it around the school as well. So they were actually on the, launch, the night that we launched the commission, the kids were part of the launch, if you know what I mean, all right? So that's just uh, some photographs of the children working. And some of the children, because uh, did some of the local animals, because we were, we were looking at the nature and the biodiversity as well, and uh, some of the kids did a whole series of animals and in my design I include this little animal in nearly all the uh, uh, wood blocks and these, this is an example of one of the wood, wood blocks it's the fair day at the market house in Caloocan oh yes, yeah okay, so that's what a wood block yeah. looks like before you put the ink on it, you roll the ink on yeah. it alright, uh, so I just brought that to, to show you uh, so there's the kids work I worked with the children for about a month and uh, uh, you see the little boy there, he's working on St. Edgens and there as he going to Caluk and, and uh, another little boy, the Badger. Uh, so the two girls working together on um, down there at Thomastown and that's her grandfather's house in mm -hmm. Romania because uh, the little girl there, as, I, as I'll explain, is uh, a great granddaughter of the last trader on the canal, William Leach. So there's the Market House in Kluge, and uh, the Gura Brothers, of which Rathwire is named after. Uh, I'll show you the finished artwork. So there's where I hung them on the wall. It just, just to make the kids feel that they're part of it, all right? Uh, so I use woodblock, and the reason I use woodblock, I never used it before, but I thought the children might like the style of work. You know, it has a kind of a simplicity about it, and that they might be able to relate to it better than me doing something very sophisticated looking. And I met eight of them, uh, for each telling a different story. And I, I printed them in Dublin. In, in Dublin, I'm a member of a fine art printmaking workshop where all the work is hand done. And uh, so I printed them up there. And then they're framed, because it's a school, there's safety reasons, so there's no glass on them. They're actually framed in perspex. Like perspex nowadays is not like the old days where it was slightly uh, white. White, yeah, yeah that's gone. Right. Now you get it's as clear as glass, but it means that if the child bumps up against it, it doesn't break. Um, so this is the the Guru Brother one. The village is named after the four Guru Brothers, and um, so they were at the top of the hill at, at Rathwire. And it was a very very famous kind of uh, part. Uh, 
this sort of situation because when the Normans arrived to Ireland, they actually, Hugh de, de Lacy built a castle there on top of the Rath, all right? And there was always a story that the dog had a gold collar and he protected the site. There was, you know, there's lots of little stories. It was a place that we would have played at, played uh, at children, so when we were children. And I uh, had a look at the type of clothes that they would have worn possibly back then. Um, so, so that's where the idea for the design comes from. Um, so this one here is um, the Royal Canal of Thomastown. And uh, Thomastown is the headquarters of uh, Waterways Ireland in Leinster. And it's got the most locks, there's eight locks uh, at, at, at Thomastown. And the canal was started in 1790 and then it finished, came to Thomastown in 1805. And as I said, uh, it was kind of, I, I knew that each family who lived there at the lock of the Thomastown, they were the, the last traders. In fact, if you go down the canal towards Darcy's Bridge, there's actually two submerged um, boats there belonging to the leeches. Um, uh, apparently, they sunk the barges and that preserves them. Now, I, I did another project on the Grand, about the Grand Canal for Offaly County Council, and um, the Heritage Boat Association have looked for those because apparently all the boats, they were all labelled with different numbers. Like Guinnesses had their own boats. Uh, you know, there was different letters like B boats and H boats and they, um, they're they all accounted for. They know that those two boats are there on, on the Royal Canal. But the boats that are on the, the barges that were on the Grand Canal were bigger in size and the Grand Canal is deeper than the Royal Canal. So that's why we have less boats on, on, on the Royal Canal. It's not, it's quite shallow, you know? Right. So some of the boats get stuck, you know? So it might explain why there's less traffic on it uh, because some of the boats, they're not compatible. Because the Heritage Boat Association has reclaimed a lot of the barges. I spent a couple of days on different barges on the Grand Canal with different owners and they were all reclaimed barges, you know? They could go back to the history of who owned them, what traders and so on. So here I, in that photograph, what, what have we seen there? Yeah, is, is the drawing. So I do the drawing in reverse on the board because you put, a, you put the drawing on reverse uh, and then when you ink it up, it comes out on the right hand side. It, it goes the other way around. So what I was trying to get there is the water flowing through the canal, through the lock, all right? And then the next, in the other image shows Maybe cutting it out, and then you've got the actual print itself. And then you see, I've got the bird up in the thing. I, in most of them, I've included some, like either a fox or whatever. I just took that from the children, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, so the next one, um, uh, my mother was in the nursing home in Kalukin, and I met the Reverend Alistair, who uh, looks after St. Etchens, and he told me there's a when they did an archaeological day of the old abbey at Caluca next door to St. Edgens, and they found a 14th century Norman baptismal font, which is in situ, in Edgens. So he let me go in and have a look at it. And I went in and the Protestant church. Yes. Oh, yeah. yeah, and it's very, very beautiful, mm -hmm. and they, they still use it to this day. And so I took rubbings of it uh, to recreate the design. I wanted to include it. So if you go back to the 1400s, there was no Protestant Catholic. Yeah. Okay, it's just Christian. So I, I, I wanted to incorporate it some way in, in, into one of the designs because it's part of our cultural her heritage. Um, so that's the print that I did from that. Um, so that's actually the Catholic Church, but I have another one. The next one coming up shortly is uh, St. Etchens, so I can kind of repeat it uh, twice. So um, there was a, a Reverend Faulkner uh, at the turn of the 1900s who was uh, an amateur archaeologist and he was the Reverend for St. Edgens. Uh, he collected quite a lot of archaeological finds from the area and uh, he, he, had, um, he, he has a book called Notes on Caloocan. Now some of these finds are actually in, 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 in the National Museum mm -hmm. and uh, I made a print that kind of brought together some of these uh, finds that he found and also some references to the fact that the school is built beside what was the sacred ash tree. 
So just beside the school, at one time there was a tree, uh, which in the Druidic tradition, the ash tree, like they believed in different trees that were sacred. Mm. And the area is known as the Barony of Fargo. And the Barony of Fargo means the people of the sacred tree. All right? And um, it's called Farabila in, in Irish. All right, so when you translate that. So apparently, an offspring of the sacred ash tree from the area was just on the corner beside the new school. Mm -hmm. So I actually included that in one, in, in one of the designs. Then there was also the giant at um, uh, Footy's Bridge, uh, which would along the canal. But apparently, it's not really Footy's Bridge. It's, it's Tutty's Bridge, coming from the Irish Tutta, which is big, fat, rower, you know, sort of big, which comes from the myth of the, uh, the giant that lived up around that area, all right? So I, I included that as well, too. And then uh, there are wayside crosses that were, you weren't sure what they are, but they're on, uh, from Rathwire going into Caloogan, they were found there, and they've, they've sort of assembled them together, but they were actually roadside crosses for people who were killed in accidents right. in the 1600s. Right. So a lot of people thought they were something else. What stable did they be doing? Pardon? What stable did they be doing? Uh, I think one of them was a horse and cart. Yeah. Somebody fell out of one. And, a lot, and, and why a lot of people could kill that horse and cart was the horses stopped when they entered this battle ride. And it's all right with their cow. You know, you were behind the cow. But if you were on top of a horse and cart and you were on the hay, yeah. and the horse just stuck. Oh yeah, and then you would kind of slip off it. Yeah. Okay, so so uh, like people told me, you know, you know the way, it's like, I did a, a lot of research before I started the project to come up with the designs. And people have all sorts of stories as to the meaning of something, you know, like things get passed out. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they get passed out incorrectly. Mm -hmm. People thought they were Celtic crosses from much earlier, but in fact, they're from the 1600s because I found the original references and the translation of who they're dedicated to or carved into the crosses, you know, uh, because they are uh, broken up. Uh, there was a leather shoe found, there was basin stones, then there was you know, one of those gold lanulas right. that are in the National Museum. So, um, yeah, I'm just trying to show people what actually was there because like there's new housing estates, people not sure you know, uh, what exactly was there before. Also this huge transition from being agricultural to, you know, it being a kind of a commuter area to some extent. Uh, so the next one is uh, Kalushin, Kalukin train station, which there's been a campaign for 15 years to get it reopened yeah. because it stopped in 63 picking up passengers. Yeah. All right, and uh, it's not gonna take very much to open it because all they want is to put in a new platform and have a ticket machine. Yes. So it was actually, so I did research on it and it's very, very interesting because it was, the original station was actually designed by the same architect who designed Broadstone Station yes. and was renowned for the quality of um, his architectural vision in that he tended to create buildings that were very suitable for what they were meant for, right, you know, right, like as a yeah. train station. You went to Bob and Yeah, and unfortunately, the one in Kilgan was demolished, yeah. pretty much, uh, after it closed from taking up passengers. And I think his father also wrote a famous book about James Gandon, the architect, you know, built yeah. a customs house. So, the, you know, so the, this is the heritage, the legacy mm -hmm. of, of the built environment in the area, yeah. which in many ways is fairly neglected and, yeah. and not remembered. Um, so, that was it. so there you see the fox at the bottom and then the train coming through and so the Mulvaney building would be to the left now when I show you the family album um, project that I worked on uh, in a few minutes uh, what's very interesting there is somebody actually brought in a photograph of the original train station building mm -hmm. which I had never seen all right um, so that's the Galupin station one and this is the St. Etchens one. This is why I didn't include the 14th century baptismal font, because I'd already designed this one. And there's always been a rockery in front of St. Etchens. So like in the evening, all the crows would come in there. And then the, the stories, you know, the Delvin stories, the gluten crows and the Delvin ones as well, which are in the annals of Westmeath, where um, Captain Cook in Delvin didn't like the gluten crows 
thought they were riffraffs because he, he believed in reincarnation, you see. Who's um, that? Uh, Captain Cook in Delvin. Oh, you know, he built a good beehive too. Was he answered to the one in Jordan, what he called I don't know about that, but he, he had a thing about the gluten crows. He referred to them as kind of riffraff, mm -hmm. all right, and that they used to come over trying to invade over there. But, um, the, but the Bible is buried in Jordan, I think. Uh, well, this, he, Captain Cook was in the. A dog is Cook. Yes. Yeah, he, yeah, he built he built uh, a beehive tomb yes. for himself. It'll be on the border between yeah. them and Shore. Yeah. Would it? Okay, yeah, yeah okay. Uh, I wouldn't know that, but it's just that there's always been this thing between mm. Delve and the Delve and Crows and, and, and the But there's the same kind of area, the Cooks. Yeah. Mm. yeah, and like for instance, he believed in reincarnation, but he hated the Crows in the springtime when they would be nesting because they were too noisy. Yeah. So he got his workers on the estate to collect sticks for them and build their nests for them. Yeah. And of course, the crows ignored the nests. <laughs> so the, the next year he had the nests put up in the trees for them rather than just the piles of sticks. And did he use them? <laughs> no, 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 no. But it, it was the fact that he believed that you know yeah. people were reincarnated. But I, I built nests for the crows. Yeah. And they used them. Well, there was a better story about him as well, the one about uh, he believed that his grandfather was reincarnated in the dog. Yeah. And you know this money tale, don't yeah. you? Yeah, it's really funny. I'd love to illustrate it sometime. But that um, he, the dog he reckoned was hanging around with riffraff ladies from Delvin. And so he told the worker to um, basically assassinate the dog. Yeah. So, uh, but the thing was, at the time, you know, people, he used to feed the dog the best of food. Yeah. So the workers used to take the food. Yes. You know, right? The so, the, you know, so the food supply would have disappeared yeah. uh, had they shot the dog. Yeah. Anyway, he told him to bring the dog away and shoot the dog. And your man brought the dog away and uh, he just couldn't do it, right? It, it was too big a deal. So, anyway, he brought the dog back and told Mr. Cook that uh, he said, why, why not? And he said, did he say that the dog spoke to him or something like that? He said the dog spoke to him, but they put the yeah. hat and thought it was a And he couldn't shoot him. Yeah. yeah. So, he, so he couldn't shoot him, you know what I mean? So, um, anyway, so that's why I, I kind of wanted to have the Kalukan crows, because he always objected uh, <laughs> to them. Also, uh, there's a connection there with the steeple, uh, in, in the sense that uh, the... I'll show you now in a minute why, why this is connected. When I was a child, there was always a fair in Kalukan, uh, in front of the market house. Now, it used to get a bit violent at times, all right? But um, that's, that was before kind of like the marks really took over. Uh, and the market house was built, we think, by Patrick Keegan. His family had come, and actually, John Keegan is a tree surgeon out there, and he's the same family. And he told me a story about, you know, the great-great-grandmother when they came. They came to Kalukan, and uh, the mother looked out the window one day and there was a young lad hanging from the steeple of St. Etchens as it was being built yeah. and said something like, my God, the poor devil, hope he doesn't fall, not knowing it was her, his, her son. Right. But they were renowned stone builders, all right? So they worked on St. Etchens, but the Keegans are responsible for a lot of the bridges and they built the market house. Yes. You know, which is a very, very fine market. You can house. see it there automatically. Yeah, and it, it's quite neglected at the moment. But uh, three years ago, uh, the architecture of Venice Biennale, uh, the, the presentation that Ireland gave was on market houses and the new role that market houses could play in revitalizing small towns and villages. Right. You know, so it would be lovely to see. Uh, the market house in Kalugan restored and new uses found for it. Because there was three banks used it when I was a child. Yeah. And then the, the forecourt was used, uh, as I said, for the fair. Um, you know, it, it always had served a kind of an important function as a centerpiece to the village. But not at the moment. Not at the moment. I mean, there's somebody selling machinery from the forecourt, farm machinery, and the building itself is not in use. You know, it's in quite. Yeah, um, dis uh, disarray, really. So there it is. That's th that's this one here. Yeah. Right. Okay. So there, I'm trying to show the architectural heritage. Um, and the next one um, is the Cranog, and the Cranog is an artificial island, man-made. Yeah. Usually made, you know, yeah. for defence purposes. Uh, so that's just the drawing. 
and they'd be cutting it out, and we've got our heron, because we've always had, we've had a heron for years, resident heron on the canal at Tomstown, and it just flies back and forth, back and forth, and everybody knows them, so, uh, so, there was a tonic vent, which is, uh, which is out the Clohan Road, uh, there was a cranog found there, yeah. and uh, you can see there, there was a bronze pin and a giant canoe made out of bog oak, that was found there. And then there was another one, as you go to Raharnia, the Jorastown Road, uh, found there. So I, I just wanted them to, to, the kids to know, you know, what was actually there in, in previous time. So uh, this is just to show, uh, in terms of human scale, the size of the work, yeah. uh, just hanging it up in the school. So there's eight of them. And, and they cover, you know, the built heritage, the folklore, uh, the archaeological finds, uh, the, the architectural um, heritage uh, of the area. And um, it's it's kind of hard to photograph it because it's, there's light on uh, facing facing it, but that gives you a good idea of uh, what it's actually like up in the wall. And then on the rest of the corridors, are the kids. Uh, so that's that project, all right? So the next one, following from that one, um, I did what was called a family album project, um, because around that time my mother died and she was 98. And I, I was sort of thinking about all the information that woman had about the local area and, and all sorts of uh, things. And that um, also that, that kind of idea of the sense of place and, 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 and the change in how people worked in the area from being very agricultural to you know all sorts of other kind of ways of living. And, and, and that if I if we didn't kind of collect some of the photographs, uh, that a lot of that history would be would actually be lost. Um, so uh, I put out a notice that and for, uh, during Heritage Week, uh, I worked with a photographer who lives beside me, Tim Durham. He just lives down the road as a professional photographer. So we invited as many families as possible to come to the house and bring their family albums with them. So 43 families turned up with their albums over a period of about three weeks. And what we did was we uh, selected a selection of their photographs and uh, made a record of them, like uh, sort of wrote a page on each photograph, what was in it and what it recorded and so on and who the family was. And um, so when it was finished, uh, a couple of months later, we did a slideshow of all the photographs and an exhibition of some of the photographs. I printed up some of them, mm -hmm. and uh, we had a sort of a big evening in the local hall. Uh, you know, probably a tea and coffee after the slideshow. I, I don't know many people came. I think about two hundred or one hundred and sixty people came. It was a fantastic evening, and um, uh, I, people really enjoyed seeing people's photographs and remembering people and places and things and things that people did or seeing the changes. What I find really interesting, because I don't know most of the people in the photographs, is the way that it documents uh, you know, what people wore, what kind of transport people had, what people worked at. Like, like in a way, you don't have to know who the people are. Yeah. I know that's important to the families, but uh, I could imagine, you know the way they have announced that we're going to get new film studios in the area, I was thinking for somebody in the film business and they want to recreate a particular era, you're looking at the style of dress. So where do you get that information? You get it from some of the photographs. Yeah, yeah. Do, you, do you know what I mean? Yeah. What kind of are people or what do the houses look like? So what I did here is I um, took a selection of them, of the photographs for you, just to show them to you, okay? Um, and they, they're actually stored here in the library. And I think I don't know Idea, but I think if you if people put in a request, yeah, they can they be accessed from the see yeah. them, you know what I mean. But I, I get asked continuously to do more about it, you know what I mean? So at some time I would like to do a book, kind of bringing all the different strands that I'm interested in uh, together about the area, you know, because I think people would find it very interesting. Um, now I, I remember who brought in some of the photographs, not all of them. But this is the way that we document them. We scan them, all right? And, and each family then got their own page like this, okay? 
and then they were labelled. Now, we, we wouldn't have had the time, like some people's albums were out of this world. There was a couple of families that, I mean, I don't know who the photographers in the family were, because we're going back to an era, in some cases, to the 1840s, for one set of photographs, that uh, who had the camera? You know what I mean? It would, would have been the er, early the days of photography. Yeah. You, you, you know what I mean? So some of the work that we did collect is fairly uh, precious. I, I one or two of them, like old daguerreotypes from the 1800s. Yeah. Um, so this was the Oxley families. They, they live actually around the corner from me, and they had fantastic photographs. Uh, uh, one of the biggest albums that we saw, uh, in fact, it came in with three or four, and some of the photographs were at least 150, 120, 30 years old. Um, so we just took a selection of them. Uh, and how I, we advertised them in the local area, I, 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 I went to Fagan's and I printed up some of the photographs large scale to advertise the slideshow in the GEA hall, and tried to pick photographs for the particular shops that suited the particular shops. Um, so here are, are, are some of them there, just met up. So this is the actual slideshow. Now, I won't have a lot to say about that. You can just have a, a look. That's, I know who these are, Jack Murphy, they were from Rathwater. And they're not all good photographs, but. That's Jack Murphy. That's Jack Murphy. Yeah, yeah. A young Jack Murphy yeah, yeah. and his wife. His daughter Anne came and yeah. brought the photographs. Which was also really interesting. The reason it took a long time as well, apart from the scanning, was once people opened up the album and then they say, well, yeah. this is my father, and that's my brother, and that's my brother who's dead. And then it would go on and on and on. And after the three weeks, I remember I lay down on the sofa. I was so exhausted. But it was really, really, really interesting. You know? Very tedious. I didn't really find it tedious. I just found it fascinating that, that yeah. there was such a wealth of material. And I couldn't get over the interest. Mm -hmm. Do you, you know what I mean? It's, you know, I have been stopped a few times, quite a few times, saying, when are you going to do something else? You know, that people are really invested in their local area. They're just waiting for an opportunity for somebody to do something, you know? See, I, 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 the ones I picked to, to, to show you, it's like, I don't know if you remember, going to the bog or, yeah. you know, or making hay, you know? Like it's not made, you see the stoops of hay there, and you know? Cheese, cheese. And, and the cups of tea, yeah. all right? Um, I used to love that when I was small. I don't know, food outdoors is always tastier, isn't it? Nobody ever pretend about the tea and the bog. Not the, really, no, the this, is, this is making the hay. Yeah. You know, and so I'm looking at the clothes and all that kind of thing, like people are really poor, yeah. for the most part. The dog. So, you know, just from the art point of view, I'm really interested in, you know, like I can see the way the stoops are made there, you know, and all that kind of thing. I also remember, you know, when I was looking at them, it reminded me of, you know, the first time I saw German visitors and they had raincoats. Because in Ireland we didn't have raincoats. Um, I had a brother in law that grew up in Longford and he had a pub, you know, spirit grocers, one of those type old fashioned pubs. And there was a man called the Connacht Man. He must have come from Connacht, all right? But none of the men had raincoats. They all went to the bog with a suit that must have bought for a wedding at one time. And then just wore it and wore it and wore it. Yeah. There was moss on, on, on your man's shoulders, you know, from obviously getting damp yeah. and drying and getting damp. You know, you wouldn't see that nowadays. But it was probably see. You, you wouldn't probably see that. Probably with the sweat. Oh, it was, yeah, yeah, I think so. Yeah, yeah. So here's the cup of hay. You know, again, another thing you never see anymore, really. And this huge big haystack yeah. here, that building there. that. Yeah. yeah. And the senior people done the building of them. Oh, did they? Okay. Yeah, yeah. The, but that was the most important thing, and the most junior done the kitchen. Oh, I see, okay. Yeah. All right. And I don't know how old this photograph is. Yeah, that's a binder uh, for Hilly Ground. Usually it was only two horses, but uh, Hilly Ground they had out three. Oh really? Okay, I was wondering. And that's sometimes they couldn't even cut going up a hill. They had to cut just coming down a hill. The oh, three yeah. horses were meant to pull the, uh, pull the binder. The binder was very heavy. To pull it up the hill, free wheeling, and then they just cut coming down. So you remember that, do you? I don't remember, but I heard them talking about it. And yeah, they, no, I they, don't remember that. There's I an old binder beyond one of my farms. 
I'd say and that's probably 1920s, would it be? Or 30s or 40s? Mm, yeah, yeah, yeah. So the next but one. But it was compulsory tillage at that time. You, you had to have a turn of your land in tillage. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah, so there's, uh, there's a lot of hardship. This house is pretty much unchanged. It's the house, if you know Caloocan, you know when you're coming into Caloocan? It was, it, it was originally owned by Lord Longford, mm -hmm. and uh, the Dunn family lived in it. Well, no, the Baileys, that's it, and they're still there, they're around the corner. And it, it was only recently sold there before the COVID and restored. And I think it, the, nobody ever lived on the left-hand side of the house. And it's right on the corner. It's, it's kind of a dangerous corner because you come into Caloocan this way. Yeah. and say the edges oh, is in front of you. Yeah. It's very hard to see if you need to go for a wire. Uh, but I, th I think I read somewhere that it was actually a police barracks on the other side. And that might have explained why nobody ever lived in it. But it is occupied now. A family bought it and restored it in recent mm -hmm. times. But it's pretty much unchanged. Uh, you see, the, the Packenhams are all buried in St. Edgeons. You know Tully Nally? Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, and they were the local one of the local landlords, so they owned a lot of property in the area. So that was one of their houses. And that's that little house from Rathwire, and it's still there. And those were some of my old neighbours. And the woman in the middle had a box brownie camera, and she took a lot of the local photographs. And I think that this building here is now the new post office in Rathwire. It was the pub called The Hill. And I can remember Margaret Barry, the travelling singer, singing in it when I was a child. But it was kind of a men's only pub. Mm -hmm. you know, do you know what I mean? The windows were always really low in it. But I found a reference uh, in the library to it. There has been a kind of a public house there in that spot for a couple of hundred years. You all, all remember the communion? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's really funny, yeah, because uh, we used to do the May tree as well there, you know, and the mm -hmm. processions. All those things that are gone, and the, I, I sound like my tunes of that, you know what I mean? It's like a different world, isn't it? And that's the village of Rathwire. It hasn't really changed very much. That's the house I grew up in, on the right hand side, and that's my father's car. And then outside the church with our hats. So this is uh, what was called Jimmy's Pub, but before that it was Flynn's. And there was another family between that, but it was a coach hotel in, in, in uh, Rathwire. Like contrary to what people think, there's very little in Rathwire now. Mm -hmm. But when I was a child, there was a tailor and a coffin maker and a butcher and three shops, um, a spirit grocer, a pub, all these kind of things, um, and they're all gone. And just recently, that was sold, and it's no longer a pub. Um, which, that's still one of so the. There's ones. no pub in Rathwire now? No, right. no, it's gone. You see, there's a dance hall as well in Rathwire, the workman's hall. In fact, my mother loved to dance. Um, my father wasn't a dancer at all. When we were small, we would creep up to have a look, and we'd see my mother flying around the floor, you know? Because it has a sprung floor at the Workman's Hall. It was built by the local people. Mm. Now it's a computer, um, you know, it's a Golden Years Club and a few other things, but they don't have dances and things like that in it. So, in a way, the area was quite rich in what was actually going on. Which, and quite a lot of that is lost, although it's a lot of new people who are trying to recreate some of those things. Mm -hmm. Now, this is from the Purton family, who were the local landlords, and uh, it's a daguerreotype from the 1850s, around that time. I, I don't have the exact date, but they had a whole collection of them, and uh, so there'd be very early photography, um, kind of super, superb, like the standard, it could go to the National Archives. They're, mm. they're of such quality. And um, Captain Purden, they he was head of the Hereford Society of Ireland, and only I think in the coming up to the nineties, he sold off the herd. It was a pedigree herd, and um, they actually have a book of photographs going back to around nineteen twelve when they started the herd. 
and they documented the winners of the herd right up until they sold the herd. So it surely broken up. Yeah, it's an amazing book of photographs. It would make a great pull-out section in a book because it's so unusual. All these photographs of Pomp the prize her for cattle. I, I had never seen anything like it before. Um, the other thing that was huge in Kalukan growing up was uh, the hunt. And they'd meet in the village. Yeah, I suppose. They changed their point on the disaster of humans. Yeah, so, uh, so that's, that's them setting up there for the hunt. And that's their wedding photograph. And then I think that's taken out the Clon Road. Uh, I think it's the Cassidy family. Yeah, it is the Cassidy family. I love this photograph. It reminds me of the house we grew up in. You know, everybody had the flowery wallpaper and the sacred heart and the, the, the lamp uh, to light it. Of course, there's the television has come in. My father and mother were really funny. We always lived in rented houses up until we were nearly grown up. But they always had a television and a car, you know. Uh, so that was in the 60s. And then everybody would come in yeah. to the house to watch the television, you know. Um, so when I saw that one, it just reminded, brought me back to the ICA. I was actually at a meeting last day for a women's um, shed, which is kind of taken over the ICA in a way. It's, it's sort of replacing it, you know, the men's shed movement. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But there was a meeting in Arnie last night of uh, trying to set up a new women's shed. Yeah. But actually, when I came away from it, I thought very similar to the ICA in a, in a funny sort of way, you know, right. the kind of things that people were proposing doing. Yeah. Um, the school photograph. Now, I'm not sure where that was taken, but the old school, perhaps in Rathwire. Uh, so it would have been the old, old school because the new school that I went to is now the old school, if you get my drift, because they have a brand new school. But um, I, I, can't, I, I can't identify any people in it. But I was approached by somebody recently who thinks their grand uncles are in it, and that might be Rathwire. And anybody you know this Raharni, the weir, weir at Raharni. And this is from the Boyle collection. And they had the most superb collection of photographs that I've ever seen. So somebody in the family had a camera way back. And you see the way um, they've labeled all the people in them. Because yeah. you know, after a period of time, you, you know, once it goes through two generations, you can't even remember who the people are. But what's in them is very interesting socially and so on. You know, it's like there are no catch cottages out beside us anymore, you know, but there's a lovely one in this, the original royal house. I thought they all looked very prosperous in it. Well, but the before were taken everywhere in the dress up. Yeah, but the idea of even having a camera, yeah, you know. Was it, everything was paused in a sense. Yeah, everything was paused, but people, not many people had cameras, you know. Uh, there's the original Boyle House from Raharney. I think it's down in Matras. It's very beautiful in a way, isn't it? Mm. But it's gone. Um, and this is one of the boys, the young one, the young lads. Um, Everybody they, had a great one at that time. Yeah, yeah, my uncle said. Yeah, well, that was a lottery ticket for one. <laughs> My uncle spent all his money on me, on, on the greyhounds. He never once won. I find this one really interesting. This is from the Oxleys family. Um, um, the car, it looks like it's made out of lead, doesn't it? But it's really strong and sturdy. And that's just actually around the corner from me and you. Yeah. But again, it's just um, showing how people transported their goods yeah. mm -hmm. on what is not a tar road, either. Mm -hmm. 
Now, I recently used one of these photographs. Uh, I was asked to illustrate 10 poems for a poet. And uh, I found something in one of the photographs that people brought in that I could use. It was a poem about the lives of ordinary women in the 40s and 50s. And I was trying to find a reference, like a, a woman who would sort of be that type of woman who worked, you know, labored, you know, when work was very physical. And uh, so, you know, I can see how people would use some of these collections, you know, for information and for reference purposes. That's around the corner from us. That's Oxley's house. Oh. The one around the corner. That's the mother of Mr. Oxley. This is a re this is a really interesting one. The idea of being a tourist at a particular time. I, he doesn't know where it was taken. But it's a very unusual photograph. And uh, this photograph here is outside the Oxley's house as well. Two traveling fiddlers. Okay, I, we don't know who they are, but I use that as inspiration for. I made a large artwork for the FLA, um, which documented 18 musicians who kept a traditional life in the 40s and 50s in the Mullingar area. Um, and it was, I didn't realize there was mu a much tradition of traditional music in our part of the country, all right? Like we've always heard the country Western and so on. Uh, but what was very interesting that came out of that photograph for me was, I did the research for the project for the FLA and I couldn't believe the number of people who were involved in traditional music in the county and particularly in the piping tradition. And there was a famous piper, uh, pipe maker called, his surname was Kina from the Mungar area and he, his pipes are now in the uh, piping museum in Northumberland. Unfortunately I couldn't get to see it because Covid was on at the time I was doing the project. But then there was there was other pipers that have uh, you know you know famous pipers from there as well. And I was thinking that's probably why the pipers came here in the fifties to set up that Kyoto's came out of and the flag the idea for the flag came out of because there was a meeting in Mount Street of the pipers and out of that came the idea of Kyoto's and the flag Kyo mm -hmm. you know and then it was built on. Um, I just found that very interesting because it's not what people in their heads associate Westmead with. It's usually Clare, Galway, that kind of west of Ireland. This is the uh, Presbyterian Church as you come into Caloocan. And um, that house there, that you cannot see the front of it because it's got its back to the road. You know the house I'm talking about? No, no. Uh, when you're coming, if anybody knows, going down into Kalukan from Mullingar, mm -hmm. and when you come to that corner, oh yes, yes. yeah, and on the yes. right hand side there's a little hall. Oh, the church that's there. the yeah. Presbyterian Church, yeah. and that's the house that went yes. with it. Yeah. And it was sold in the last ten years as well and restored. Um, Anthony Farrell's mother used to live in it, that old Gigginstown house, that oh, might yeah, be near the house. Yeah. Uh, right near. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, she lived in it for quite a while, and then uh, Anthony Farrell, her son, inherited it when she died. And he's Lily Pub Press, mm -hmm. the, the book publisher. Yeah, but they originally came from Kickenstown, that was their family home, and they sold it to Michael uh, O'Leary. So that's so what somebody arrived in, apparently at one time, postcards were made of the area. Now, I don't know whether that was general all over Ireland. But this, I can't remember who brought in these postcards, but they document the centre of Canucan and this view of, of this house and, 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 and the church. And remember I mentioned to you earlier on, there's the um, Canucan train station before it was demolished. Mm. And I'd never seen that before. So that's the one that Mulvaney, the architect, designed that um, they knocked down after they stopped picking up passengers. Why did another? I have no idea. Yeah. You know, like some people are very short sighted, you know, yeah. in a way, you know? Um, and somebody, the same person came in with uh, a view of the church in Kalukan from the field opposite. Again, I'd never seen that. And basically, it, it's pretty much the same, you know, it hasn't changed. 
Loving one here of Kalupin and the market house. And you see all the shops. You see, it was the uh, it was the place that the gentry shopped in. This was their shopping village at one time. And that was actually a hotel. You know, there were several hotels and there was a bakery and there was all sorts of amenities. Like like we kind of talk about progress, but in some ways mm. we haven't progressed. It's and that's, somebody brought in just a, an overview of the village yeah. of Kalukan. And it has expanded, of course, you know. I think that's in the 70s that was taken. Um, I think, uh, I think that was a Binchy or one of those, light a penny candle. They used the um, St. Etchens Church for one of the scenes. And here's a good story. That's the mill coming out of Kalugan that was derelict all my life, which has been restored by the Boyle family. So that's a good story, because they've done a fantastic job. And you know, we're getting a greenway from the new school that's going to run all the way to the canal. And just recently, they restored all the bridges. They sent in a company to restore the bridges. So there has been some improvements in the local infrastructure. So there's a great 1970s photograph of the um, market house. It was obviously a confirmation day or was a community money day. I'm just looking at the car, you know? It's like a real gas buster, isn't it? <laughs> you know what I mean? And again, that was taken probably in the 70s as well, maybe even earlier, of the canal, because the canal went dirty for quite a long time. And it's nice to see it all restored. So I just put a few, some fishing. Uh, there's a local guy who always did his own shooting and killing and so on. Uh, that was a local man, Paddy Bray, who did, unfortunately, his family got rid of a lot of his uh, city camera work, which would, because he was constantly using it. Um, which is a pity because it would have been a great little sort of document of the area. And the same, um, his daughter brought these photographs in to tourists back in the 60s and 70s who came and stayed in the house next door, she said, every year for a week when nobody went anywhere. <laughs> I just thought that was funny because I said, Who are these people? And she said, Two tourists who came to the woman next door every single year from Dublin. That's my father and ourselves. That's me. He's holding me on our holidays in Ackle during the summer, where it rained in Ackle for the entire month. <laughs> and when we came back, everybody was brown as a berry because there had been a heat wave. <laughs> and this will remind you of another time, won't it? That's from the Bray photographs. The second on the right is one of the Brays. <coughs> And these are the showers from Kalukan, and they were farmers and their cattle, when they would milk the cattle, they would come down through the village, and they used to have a bakery as well. And then this is kind of an interesting photograph. It's of uh, the post office has just left Mulligan's, all right? But this, it was a hardware store and so on. And that's, they, they brought in that photograph to show me what it looked like. There has always been a post office. It was always the uh, central post office for a huge big catchment area. Now it has moved around a little bit, but it was in this spot on the right hand side for 60, 70 years, maybe or more. And again, another good story, the restoration of the canal. That was taken in the 70s. And you can see that's Nanny Quinn's, you know the pop Nanny Quinn's? So there's been so much work done there. It's such a great amenity. Um, um, it's just a few more, okay? Um, I just find these photographs this is from the Crouch family. Um, just from a completely different era entirely, you know? I think there's a guy called Dan, but just the mode of transport and the little donkey, something you never see anymore. Uh, he's got uh, one of those uh, pipes, you know, the clay pipes. 
I love this photograph, they look so proud. See this skillet pot and, and, and the brushes for sweeping and so on. This was the photograph I used that the older woman carrying the buckets of water from the well. And then I, I, I used that as a poster for the hairdressers <laughs> to advertise the, um, the slideshow that we gave. I love that photograph, she's laughing her head off. And then there's some of uh, cutting the ball. Mm. I mean, that's where everybody got their fuel around us, was from the bog. Day on the bog. Picking potatoes, God, we used to have to do that for the local farmer. And making hay. An evening out on the canal. And one of the last hatched houses in the area just there, Thomas John beside the canal, but it's gone. And I think this might be Riversdale House in uh, Raharney, it's gone as well. And I think this house burnt down as well, that's Raharney. Weir's post office is here on the right. And then, uh, this is Billy Caden, he, he, he had his own dark room in Thomastown. He, he was an amateur photographer, well, he's still alive. But the, you know, it's a container that he bought and he used to develop his own photographs. So I haven't seen all these photographs, but I mean, there's probably room for doing another project. And this is Nanny Quinn's. All right? Do you see the window on the left hand side? That was the shop. Okay? It's a beautiful photograph, actually. Yeah. It's no longer that colour, isn't it? It's bright yellow. <laughs> And here is Nanny Quinn herself on the right hand side. And that's what the pub used to look like. And then this is a lady, one of the Oxleys, and she had polio. It's the year of polio. And they got a handmade machine for her to get around in. And we were children. My brothers tried to steal that so many times because it was it was electric. And she would come up and uh, to the village to do her shopping and so on, and you would hear it coming. I mean, it looks like a motorbike in the front, and then she's got her seat because she couldn't walk properly. And we thought, oh, as children, we thought that was fascinating. It was. I would love. It. You know what I mean? What child would love it? So, uh, and that's uh, the house next door to Nanny Williams. So they were fine big houses, and that's it. Uh -huh. Oh, there. Very good. Very entertaining, isn't it? To see the photographs, just to notice all the details and all what people are wearing mm -hmm. and what they're doing and so on. You know, I mean, that's just a selection. It's changed, as it goes along. Yeah, yeah. That's you know, it is a selection of of, of 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 the photographs. I mean, you can see why it took so long to, you know, when you were scanning them because you couldn't help but look at them and start talking about them. And, I mean, it is a really rich resource, isn't it? You know, Definitely. Thank it's you so much for that, Charlie. Yeah, that was a really you, interesting yeah. talk. And I'm standing here thinking of the amount of projects that you could do out of just what you've shown us here today, like further on and everything. It's amazing. Well, I mean, when I saw, like, the Purton's, uh, you know, all the cattle photographs and that book, you know, I could see that as a, a, just a section in a book, you know, a pull-out section where you could... You know, because it's so unusual. Documentary. Yeah, but like, I mean, we live in a kind of agricultural area, so I could see somebody from, you know, uh, what's what's the farmers the farmers farmers journal, you know, or writing an essay on it. Ireland's Eye, or no, I I had this idea of producing a book mm. on different aspects, you know, maybe the architecture and the role of market houses and so on, maybe you know, and getting different people to write mm. really good essays about each section, if you know what I mean. Definitely. Because then I think it would be of interest nationally, even though the photographs are local. Mm. Because, yes, yeah. you know, it's general to the whole country, you know what I mean? So, mm. I mean, that I would like to do that, but whether that will happen, I don't know. This is what I'm showing you, you missed the, I did a project for the local school based on the heritage and the architecture and archaeology, and I made woodblocks, prints, 
So I brought in one of them, you know, they're carved. It's the, the market house in Luke and on a fair day. And then I printed it. So it's printed on paper and then it's in the school. So that's it.